baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6, 3 through 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Because I'm going to say anything so profound, but I do think that it'd be worth your while. I don't intend to get in a big hurry, and I don't even know whether we're going to get finished tonight. But I do think that there's some things that we need to talk about tonight. We could almost just call this a saints meeting tonight. We don't have any visitors here tonight. Most everybody that's here is home folks, and we can get kind of personal tonight, and I intend to do that. I hope I can say what I need to say tonight and say it in a, in a manner, in a, in a way that you'll receive it is from the Lord, and uh, for, for some it might, uh, might be rather pointed, to others it might leave you wondering what I'm talking about, but if you have any questions, I don't think there'll be too many of them. You come to me and ask me if you need any special, uh, special instructions on what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Primarily, I just want to speak to you tonight about church discipline. Church discipline. Now, we've been endeavoring lately to bring our church files up to date as far as those who are actually members of the church. And uh, we have a qualifying procedure for that. And we never mentioned church membership to anybody unless we feel that it's necessary at a particular time that we conduct some business that we would have to use official names to do the voting. But uh, we don't have business meetings all that often. We just do the work of God. We don't have to have all that many business meetings. But there might be times that we would, we would have to and we want to have a current up-to-date membership file every year so that we'll know who it is that claims this is their church. And who it is that claims this is the, the body that they identify with and those that respect me as their pastor and will take instruction from me and from the, the elders that uh, serve here in this particular local congregation. I want you to look with me tonight to the book of Second Timothy, chapter 3, and let's read verses 16 and 17 together out loud, okay? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Let me wait a moment there till you all get there. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Let's read out loud together. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect Truly furnished unto all good works. I want you to read it one more time. We could talk all night and not to exhaust that particular passage of Scripture as to what it really, really means and the connotation that is suggested here. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect really furnished unto all good works. Church discipline. How many believe it's important that we have disciplines that govern us? If we don't, we're in a mess. There are churches in our world today that have absolutely no procedure whereby they govern themselves. They just let everybody do as they choose and just say they love Jesus. But... Basically, there can't be anything profitable come from something like that. It would be great if everything could be handled by just simply saying we all love God and everything works itself out. It doesn't work that way. In fact, just a great percentage of the epistles are given primarily to instruction. Now, notice in this passage of Scripture, it talks about the, the Word of God, Scripture, being uh, profitable. 
My son and I were talking at length here recently about a Bible study that the Lord had laid on his heart about the mindset of Christ. You hear so many things said today about the mindset. Whatever it is we have our mind set on, well, then that's what we do without respect to anything. It's amazing how some people can get their mind set on something and logic and reason and scripture and instruction and encouragement and admonition and rebuke and reproof and love and gentleness and tenderness and mercy and everything that any particular person can exercise from any viewpoint, be it leadership, parent, grandparent, father, mother, neighbor, friend, that person is not going to listen to anything anybody has to say because they have their mind set on doing what they're going to do and you can like it or they or you can lump it. How many have ever seen anybody like that? Now, obviously, sometimes these attitudes get into the local church. Sometimes people get their mind set on specific things about what they think holiness is. Nobody's going to change them. Pastor can't change them. Church can't change them. The Bible can't change them. God can't change them. They're going to do as they choose. So everybody just has to like them the way they are because they don't intend to ever change. doesn't matter how many scriptures you can show. Others, young people, sometimes it enters in the area of dating. You give them all the scriptures, dangers, warnings, rebuke, reproof, consequences, history, examples, everything, and give them ample warning. And they simply will say, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. It gets down to marriage. Sometimes it involves believers and unbelievers. And you, you make the statement, here's what the Bible has to say. This is what the Word of God has to say. And the person that has their mind set on doing what they're going to do, they're going to do what they do. And you can like it. You can lump it. You can head in. You can head out because they're not going to change. But the Bible says, let this mind be in you that also was in Christ Jesus. So you see, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So the Logos, the intentions of God, eternal, Jehovah, that mind that was in eternal God was in that man, Christ Jesus. And Jesus said, I can do nothing except the Father. It's in me. He's the one that does the work. So Jesus' humanity and his flesh, which was like your flesh and my flesh, had to yield the fleshly side, to the will of eternal God, the Spirit. And God in Christ could only reconcile the world to himself if Christ had his mind made up to be obedient to what he knew he was sent to accomplish. Say, praise the Lord. So the flesh can't do its thing, and the Spirit of God do its thing in the same vessel. And so if we are to have the same mind as Christ Jesus, what this actually is saying is although we don't have the volume of this book recorded in our mind that we can just play it back on a cassette tape player, what God is saying is let the same mind that was in Christ be in you. So that whatever this Bible says, whatever the book says, this is the mind of God. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Let the Word of God be final. Let the Word of God be the criteria from which we base all decisions. Let the Word of God be the governing factor. Let it be the reproving factor. Let it be the rebuking factor. Let it be the encouraging factor so that when we come to the end of life that we can simply say, I have obeyed the Word of God. My spirit is in agreement with God's spirit, and therefore I have no fear whatsoever of the judgment. Simple, plain. So the Bible says that this mind that I'm speaking about then tonight, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God, and is for many things. One of them is reproof. Let's all say reproof. How many know what the word reproof means? Somebody define it for me quickly here, what you think it means, reproof. Anybody know what reproof means? Sister Hicks? It means that when we're wrong, that we're willing to be uh, corrected in our wrongs. Doesn't mean you were the only one that ever was wrong. It just simply means that when the Bible says this is the way it should be and we find ourselves in error to the way that God said it should be, then we take the reproof. Don't have to have any big to do over it. Just simply say, God, I got the message and I'll change my way of doing things. All right? Then the Bible says it's for doctrine. What does the word doctrine mean? 
Somebody tell me what doctrine. Brother Hicks, tell me what doctrine means to you. It's a basis upon which everything we do is founded. God's Word has to be the basis upon which everything that we do has its roots. All right? Then the Bible says it's also for instruction. Somebody define for me then what instruction is. How many of you remember what I told you in a recent Bible study that I had learned about instruction? Instruction goes in advance of teaching. We have the Bible, whether I ever get around to certain subjects to teach it. We know the Bible says that we should study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we have instructions that come from the word of God. Then we have teachers that take the Word of God and instruct us according to what the Bible says. And then beyond that comes training. And discipline that we're talking about tonight comes through the training process, training of our mind, training of our flesh, training of our emotions, training of our attitude, so that we can be in agreement with what is taught from God's Word. I'd like for you to write this down tonight in your notes. I'm sure I've said it before, but I've learned this in counseling and dealing with people. And uh, this is true of you or me or anybody else. When our emotions are the basis upon which we live and make decisions, if we get mad and we make decisions based on how mad we were, or we make decisions based on how aggravated we are, or we make decisions based on how we want to show that we can have our way, that is a very immature foundation upon which to make decisions. When we are ruled by our emotions, our bodies get older but our emotions stand still. There's a lot of people that are 50 and 60 years old tonight that as far as their ability to make proper decisions, they're just exactly like they were in the teen years when they rebelled against whatever there was in the way of discipline. And whatever point in life we rebel against God, and we rebel against His Word, we rebel against His ministry, we rebel against what we know what God says to do, we cease to grow emotionally, spiritually, and uh, in many respects, even intellectually. And that's what causes a lot of people to become emotional cripples, spiritual cripples, and in a real sense in our world today, just literally cripples as far as being able to, to progress in life with any degree of, uh, of continuity. That's what causes the welfare rolls to be so big. A lot of people have never grown beyond emotions. Somebody says, I won't work from, for that kind of money. I'll just stay home let the government feed me. And what happens is they never mature beyond that particular point because they think at that point on, everybody owes them something. Say, praise the Lord. Amen. Makes it hard on the ones that are worthy of a little bit of help. So I'm talking to you tonight about discipline. All right, let's say instruction in righteousness. The pastor has to be used of God in instructing people in the ways of righteousness so that we don't stumble our way through life and flounder our way in our daily walk with God and see the work of God stymied in its ability to grow. Now, this particular passage of Scripture will lay a foundation tonight that we can at least start. I would have you to know that tonight as pastor, sometimes I'm sure some of you don't think I know everything that's going on. Probably I don't. I venture to say that I know most of what's going on, good and bad. God would not give me the responsibility of... Uh, leading a flock like this and keep me in the dark as to what was going on. I don't know everything that's going on. I don't particularly want to know everything that's going on. But anything that is particularly involved that would make this church stymied in its growth or something that we could remove from the way to make it more easy to grow, then God wants me to know about those things. So over the course of time, you learn that people that are loyal and faithful come to you with suggestions or things that they see that... Maybe they think I should know. It's not tattling. It's out of a deep desire and interest that we could do the will of God. And so I would have to say that in the last few months, there have been several things that, that seem to be in agreement with what I already have recognized, and others have seemed to have a concern, not a critical attitude, but an attitude of really caring about our local church. Say, praise God. And so... I feel tonight that it's time to address some of the things that I feel are right before my eyes, and uh, I'm going to go through some of these things, and then we'll see how far we get before I think it's time to go home. I think, number one, there has to be more respect in this church. Let's say respect. Amen. Let's say respect. 
There has to be respect for God's Word. There has to be respect for God's body. There has to be respect for God's people. There has to be respect for the house of God and the ministry. And when we do not respect God's house, God is not pleased with that. Amen. I would not uh, like to give us the label of being the least respectful church I've ever been around, but I want to tell you, we're very near to being one of the worst in the way of respect that I've ever seen in all my life. I travel enough that I can see what goes on other places. And we are going to have to get a handle on the behavior of our children around here. The lobby there sometimes is just a fun and games atmosphere. You almost have to get out of the way to keep them getting knocked down. I know the church isn't designed properly to make it functional in that manner, but we as parents are going to have to know where our kids are at all times and not to, uh, be too surprised if one of them's killed on that parking lot out there. Because when they run the whole property here, it's a miracle of God that we don't have more tragedies than we do. Let's say respect. There is a real lack of respect on the part of some that are adults, even for the ministry of the church. There are those who, who talk out while I'm teaching a Bible study sometime and disagree with what I have to say and do it out loud so that everybody all around can hear their remarks. Some get up and storm out when they don't like what I'm saying. They don't respect themselves. They don't respect the Bible. They don't respect me as a pastor. They don't respect anybody because they, first of all, don't respect themselves. I'm going to authorize the elders of this church that if respect doesn't pick up on the part of some people that are so disrespectful, we will ask them to leave, and we will see that they do not disturb the services when they're here. Amen. Thank you. We can move on now. How many, how many are with me now? We're not playing games. I am tired of disrespect. I heard while I was out of town that it was hard for even Brother Lawrence to even speak one particular service because of the disrespect. Now, the Bible does give me the instruction that I should go to the person personally first and talk to them about some of these things. And I want to tell you that some people that are disrespectful, I've talked to them more times than I could count almost, and it hasn't changed them at all. And so, if they don't respect God's house, I do not want them occupying space in here when I'm trying to win some people that would be interested in the gospel and will never be attracted to a church that doesn't have respect in its sanctuary, at least. Say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. People that's got brains and got a, any degree of intelligence will not be attracted to a church that does not have respect in the sanctuary. I mean, I'm telling you the truth. If I was out looking for a church to go to, which I don't think is personally the will of God for people that know the truth to be out patrolling around looking for a church, sheep ought to be transferred from one fold to another. That's why I don't get uh, high and mighty when somebody moves to our town and doesn't know where they're going to go. I don't go out and try to compete for them. Because if I just have to get in there and compete for somebody that's moved to town, they're welcome to come here, but I'm not going to go and try to compete for them because they shouldn't have to be patrolling around looking in the first place. It ought to be that their pastor has told them where to go when they left that fold and instructed them where they should lie somewhere. They don't ship sheep to Chicago market and say, wherever you just dump them, they'll find somebody that likes them. Say amen? They don't ship them into the stockyards down there and say, don't worry about who they belong to, they'll find somebody that'll own them. Now, I'm being real plain with you tonight because this is a, a saint's type of instruction. I'm telling you tonight, the Bible gives us some instructions how we rule and govern ourselves. Say, praise the Lord. All right. Secondly, beyond respect, and some of these things are very interrelated, is honor. Let's say honor. Honor, the Bible says, your father and your mother. A person that cannot honor their father and their mother, even if they seem not to be worthy of the honor all the time. It ought to be that there should be a spirit of honor in a newborn person that has Christ in them that they would pay more respect than maybe that they would uh, think is necessary to their mother and father. I don't believe that there's place in the body of Christ for people that don't honor their father and mother. They'll never be effective in the body of Christ. And then the Bible says that even to the ministry and those that rule well, the Bible says they are worthy of double honor. That doesn't mean you have to go around patting them on the back all the time or that you need to give them great sums of money or buy them great big expensive gifts, but it simply means that if somebody is endeavoring to lead us in the right way, we ought to pay honor to that person. 
Say praise the Lord. Whoever it is that fills this pulpit, if I'm not in town, they are worthy of the honor that this office uh, has behind it. Say praise God. If it's Brother Lawrence, if it's Brother Lehman, if it's a visiting minister or whoever, we ought to have enough plain old common sense to know that God is... It's His Word that we're paying respect and honor to, and the man or the woman that's delivering it in the fear of God. Let's say praise the Lord. Amen. Let's say discipline. All right. In the era of discipline, I would like to give you some, some, uh, uh, some examples that came to my mind as I was preparing some notes for this Bible study tonight. The Bible instructs us that we think of the body of Christ primarily as a body. One illustration refers to it as a body. Another illustration refers to it as a house that's being built. Another illustration refers to it as, a, you know, a, a, well, the church as we know it today. But primarily, when you think about a body, if a person inflicts injury upon themselves because of foolishness or not caring, they do not seem to get the sympathy that they would get if what happened to them happened beyond all their control. They praise the Lord. If somebody is too scared to get their rotten tooth pulled, and if somebody's too scared to, uh, to go like I was for so many years and get that hernia taken put, care of, it got to where it's affecting me, and it was affecting you. I was afraid I was going to die in a pulpit sometime. I had prayer for me, and I'd rather, much rather have been healed than to go to that. It was a hard thing for me to ever go and have a doctor cut on me, because I had everything in me resents that. I wanted Jesus to get the glory for it. But, you see, it had to be done, or I was done. Say, praise the Lord. When that thing got so big that I couldn't hardly even uh, uh, live sometimes, and I'd have to go back in that office and lay down. And you said, Pastor, several of you said, Pastor, you better get something done because I'm scared you're going to die. Well, my wife said, listen, they won't feel bad at you for going and getting that thing taken care of. I, and I, I didn't want your faith to be affected. I wanted to still believe in miracles, and I do believe in miracles. But I'm here tonight, a much healthier man, because I braved the, the fear and went ahead and got the thing done. So you take a body. How many of you wash your face every day? How many of you just wash one side of it? And just leave the other side because you don't want to get too carried away with cleanliness. Well, of course not. Our bodies all have to be washed, don't they? Sometimes you hear the pet expression, you know, I take a bath every Saturday whether I need it or not. But we're not living in the day when we had to all pass the big number three wash tub around and leave the room while somebody else got in the water and the kids fall over who got to be in the water first. Some of us have lived through that particular time. There is water, but we have to take care of our body. And if we do not take care of our body and we stink, it isn't long till people don't have respect for us because we don't have respect for ourselves. Say, praise the Lord. Now, none of us are immune from having body odor from time to time. Hate to, hate to tell you that, but uh, it's the truth. In an old suit that you've sweated through two or three services with, I want you to know that thing stinks like a goat. That thing stinks, and you'll not make it smell any better by putting on a little extra minin. And yet, sometimes the pastor has to give instructions on cleanliness, even about the body. And some that stink the most get offended the greatest because they don't want anybody telling them to clean up. You'd be surprised at the times that over the period of years that people will come to a pastor and say, do you notice how sister so-and-so stinks? Well, what am I going to say? Am I going to lie and say, no, she don't stink, that's just all in your mind. And, uh, or brother so-and-so stink because men stink just the same as women do. Or uh, so-and-so's children stink, and so forth and so on. And so I said, well, I know you're right, and I've smelled it too, and I'll try to, try to be as sweet as we can and suggest some soap and suggest some things that would make it different. And I have even been involved over the years of even going to people's house, and, and uh, our ladies would instruct them how to do the washing, how to wash diapers, and how to do the whole thing. And the minute you got the job done for them, they went back to their dirty way of life, their house stunk. They're, they smell like a stable, and you couldn't get the stink out of them because their house stunk just the way they stink. Now, I want you to know tonight there have been many souls lost because people didn't care enough about their own personal bodily cleanliness. I'm telling you tonight, God wants our bodies to be clean. 
I won't go much further with that. Some people have a greater problem than others. I knew one of our, one of our relatives that is just a precious person, has everything going, and holds a responsible position, and she uh, does everything in her power. But she's a beautiful lady. If you saw her, you'd never dream she had the problem. But she has a body odor problem, and she knows it. And she has done everything in her power to get rid of that problem without any long-lasting effect other than taking several baths and putting on lots of perfume and caring about what she smells like to other people. Women and men both ought to care how they come across to other people in the areas of body cleanliness, bad breath, dirty teeth, dirty, grimy, gritty hair, stinky feet, dirty socks. I could go on and on and on. I don't intend to spend a lot of time on this, but I want to tell you, it's hard to pray when somebody's praying next to you that has socks on that hasn't been changed in, in several services. Now, say amen. amen. How many believe this is all right that we take a little time for this? I'm not, I'm not working for Avon or anybody like that. I'm just telling you tonight that somewhere along the line, just good common sense will, will benefit the kingdom of God. So a clean body does help. That takes discipline. I know it's a big mess to have to wash your teeth. Who enjoys washing teeth? You don't go in and say, whoopee, I'm going to get to wash teeth a little bit here. No, it seems like sometimes a waste of time because you think, oh, my teeth are all right the way they are. I'll eat an apple. It's amazing how some kids will do almost anything other than wash their teeth. Now, when children aren't made to, to be careful about their body, they grow up and they're less careful about it when they have total control of themselves. When they don't have anybody tell them to scrub their neck and wash their teeth, they grow up and they are less caring about their personal hygiene than they were before. Some girls wonder why boys don't like them. This might be a good trip to the bar of soap and some cologne and some perfume and some neatness might help a little bit. I don't have anybody in mind when I say that. I'm just talking in general terms. Same way with boys. I don't know how in the world they'd ever get a girl. They don't care about their personal appearance. They don't brush their teeth. They don't wash their hair. They don't look sharp. If they ever intend to impress somebody, along the lines they ought to stop and say, I'm going to take care of my physical body for my sake, whether anybody ever is attracted to me or not. Okay, now, when a person doesn't take care of their body, and that is many things, then people begin to turn them off and they wonder, well, why don't people like me? Why don't people want something to do with me? I think that sometimes we can just check it out and find out about ourselves. We can learn a lot about ourselves. And in the church, let's go on down the line here. We mentioned the body. Uh, but before we go to the church, let's mention the house. How many live in a neighborhood where there's at least one person on the block that doesn't do one living thing seeming to take care of their yard? Don't tell who it is. I hope it's not you. How many live in a block where, where people... Try to keep their yard looking fairly nice. And don't you appreciate living by people that really care about their yard? And uh, if one person doesn't care about their yard, the whole neighborhood may not go over there and knock on their door and say, Man, you're messing up our neighborhood. But they'll get together and they'll look over there out of the corner of their eye and say, What in the world's going on over there? I wonder why they don't clean their yard. And so before long, the whole neighborhood begins to reject that one neighbor because his yard is not in keeping with what everybody else feels is good for the neighborhood. And so there's not as much friendliness. You don't have that close conversation that you would have if you saw that yard well kept. And so what I'm showing you tonight is, if your yard is dirty, you can forget about trying to win people to the church. If you don't care about your personal body, you can forget about winning people to God because they can't stand you, let alone your church. Say praise the Lord. Now, let's bring it on down to the members in the local church. The Bible says that the one that is often reproved, what happens? They harden, what? Their neck. And the Bible says that they're cut off, how quick? Suddenly, and that without remedy. Now, that doesn't mean that people just are severed from God every time they don't do everything right. But the Scripture seems to suggest here that when a person is, you know, has been instructed... They've been reproved, they've been even rebuked, and they've been uh, encouraged, and they've, done, uh, they've had everything come in their way that you can imagine, and they reject all of it. Well, then God begins to direct His attention to somebody else, and the, the correction isn't possible any longer. The remedy's not even there any longer because the person isn't yielding to the remedy. They're not interested in the remedy. They're not interested, and so they will grind your corn and stare you down and... Uh, 
do everything they can do to cause you discomfort, just trying to see how long it'll take to get you riled up enough to where you would confront them personally. Now, how many know I'm telling you the truth? It's the way it works. But when we yield to the will of God, when we yield to instruction, when we yield to the right thing, it's amazing that just things are settled without any ripple whatsoever, and we go on. We've all had our little ups and downs from time to time. But when these things begin to affect the church, then it becomes necessary for the elders, the ministers of the church, to to give instructions in such a manner. In fact, the Bible even tells us that after there have been repeated warnings and rebukes and reproof, and etc., then the Bible does say that we sometimes are told to rebuke before all that others will fear. Now, I haven't had to do that too many times in my life, but the Bible does say that that has to be done sometimes. So, you find here then that when a person has been reproved, rebuked, encouraged, and done everything imaginable to help that individual, and they will not respond, they won't pray, they won't worship, they'll sit and talk, they'll criticize, and then you hear reports around the neighborhood that their conduct is something that's terrible for the church to have to bear. When people can't control their emotions any more than to sit, stand and pet out in open daylight and be indecent, and yet see, to see them coming and going to this church, then that's not good advertisement for the neighbors to think there's somebody goes to that church and they're... Uh, Breathing hot and heavy and loving and mugging and everything out here on the street somewhere. I want to tell you something. It's not the will of God. We don't condone that kind of behavior. Say praise the Lord. Now, if this is too plain for you, read the Song of Solomon and read Paul's instructions. I'm not any more plain than what Paul was or what God was in his word. We have a lot of people that come to this church, but not all of them adhere to the doctrines of the church. Not all of them will take the instructions of the pastor not all of them are caring about how we are to the neighborhood or whatever. And so since they don't care, I care enough that we're going to put a stop to some of this mess. Say praise the Lord. Amen. You young people keep your hands off of one another. I don't care how much you love one another. You keep your hands off of one another. I went to a church a few years ago that I put my arm around my, my wife during church and the usher came down and pointed me out. I said, what do you want? He said, he wants your hand off the back of the seat. He wants it down in your lap. I said, okay. <laughs> you know. Now, I thought that was a bit too strict, but that was their rules. Big church, they live by it. I don't know all the reasons, but you see, in the house of God, petting is never proper. Say, praise the Lord. Now, if husband and wife are seated together, a little affection is, is certainly not to be taken sensual, but we ought to remember that what we are doing sometimes can distract from the good that God could do in a, in a particular church service. Let's say church discipline. So when a church family sees somebody rebelling against God's Word and the teaching and the pastor and the Sunday school teacher, the youth leader, or whoever it might be, then the church begins to reject that person. It's not like they don't love them, but they begin to say, you are messing up our church. How many understand what I'm talking about? When people don't live holy, they begin to say, you are, they don't come out and tell them maybe, although the Scripture does give us some some rights to rebuke or to correct those that are, are not uh, living properly, but yet we leave that most of the time to those in leadership. But when people don't honor the church enough and respect the church enough and respect the leadership of the church enough to do right, then there comes a time when they have to be corrected. And the Bible gives us all kinds of instructions about how this is to be done. The Bible says that the servant of the Lord is gentle. I have literally watched for weeks and months sometimes in some situations, and people will come and ask me, have I noticed? And I say, yes, I know what's going on. Well, uh, they don't say, well, why don't you do something about it? I just want them to know that I know. But I'm trying with everything in my heart and with my patience to not let somebody drive me to the point of doing what would be wrong. I would rather they be obedient to God and we'd never have to have a confrontation. But over the course of a lifetime, really the proof of a man's pastorate or his ministry is that he will sometime in his lifetime, as a rule, have to weather at least one confrontation with every person that's in that local church at some time in a lifetime. And that confrontation doesn't have to be big or flagrant or hurtful or mean, but it has to be that that person is willing to yield to God's will and they can get together so they can walk on up the road for God so that the will of God can be accomplished in the earth today. Say hallelujah. We can have our differences and we can make peace 
But when a person repeatedly, repeatedly confronts everybody, it has to stop somewhere. Say praise the Lord. All right, let's go on down. Just write manners down. Lots of things about manners here. You that come out to choir practice, and you're in this choir, and you bring your children here, they should not be running this building like a herd of sheep or a herd of goats all over this building. They ought to have instructions to be seated somewhere and be quiet and respectful in the house of God. Say praise the Lord. Amen. Let's say manners. Amen. Women ought to know how to sit in a chair. You have a dress on. Don't forget that when you sit down. You have a dress on. You should remember that. You have a dress on. Amen. I shouldn't have to say any more. I noticed in the youth camp instructions down in Jamaica, they were telling the young people how, in their instructions, how to go when they witnessed somewhere. They uh, instructed the girls that they should never cross their leg when they're sitting in a room. They could cross their feet for the sake of comfort, but they shouldn't cross their legs. It doesn't look ladylike. And by the same token, they shouldn't relax in this particular manner either. Say hallelujah. Let's say manners. Amen. In their little booklet, it even told how to introduce people, whose name went first, if it was an older person, if it was someone younger and all that. I thought, fantastic to teach kids some basic manners. Respect for elders. Who is to have their name mentioned first in just a simple introduction? Let's say hygiene. I've mentioned respect, honor, discipline, manners, and now hygiene. Let's say teeth. Let's say body. Write that down. Let's say hair. Amen. I'm not going to ask you how often you wash your hair. Some people don't have to wash theirs as often as others. Some people have a greasy head and some people have dry scalp. Amen. Dry scalp has a little different circumstance than oily head. Some people with oily head have to wash their hair every day just to keep on top of the situation. But what I'm saying is, whatever we have to do to look neat and presentable and clean, we ought to be willing to do that. Say hallelujah. Now, I'm talking to you plain tonight because we want to be, we want to look sharp and be somebody when we go out to, to reach out to a world that's lost. All right. Next, I want you to just write down order. 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 If you were looking for a church to go to, and you'd never been to this one, and you happened in here on one particular service, and you got knocked down or spun around trying to get a drink by a bunch of kids running through the lobby, would you come back? I don't think you would. I don't think I would. In fact, I've preached to some places in the last few years that I won't name the one that takes all the all the, the cake, but... Uh, uh, is unbelievable, but uh, ours is right up there in the top two or three uh, in disrespect for the house of God. We know how to worship God. We are friendly people. We are doing some good things in some areas, but I'll tell you what, church, we are very lacking in the, in the way of just basic order in the house of God. And disarray and lack of order will never attract brilliant, nice, well-mannered people to the house of God. The only thing we can attract with that would be someone that's just like we are, and that's not going to build the house of God. The house of God ought to be a mannerly, orderly, respectful group of people. That doesn't mean we're going to be perfect all the time, but at least we are on top of situations, and it does, just doesn't get out of hand. Let's say order. Amen. And uh, back again to this man, uh, matter of manners. Some of you kids... A little bit too big mouth to, to adults. You should never be correcting your Sunday school teachers or correcting anyone older than you. That's not your business. Doesn't matter how wrong they are, it's none of your affairs. You keep your mouth shut. You do not correct your elders. Say amen. Say praise the Lord. Now, your parents ought to be saying amen. I don't know whether you like it or not. Maybe you want them to grow up that way. I hope not. I don't want them to grow up that way, and as a pastor, I'm going to do everything in my power to keep it from happening. Amen. And when something's going on, people shouldn't be sitting back talking and uh, passing uh, time of day. When there's worship going on, we ought to all be worshiping. 
We shouldn't all be going in and out all the time. The service ought to be so arranged that people that uh, need to go to the bathroom would go. In most cases, have that done before they come in here. If it's an emergency, someone that can't help it, that's always understandable. But when a congregation gets so loose that people are coming and going and you don't know who you've got and who you don't for a whole church service, there's a, a very terrible lack of order. Okay? I've already mentioned petting in public. And I think sometimes in the summertime, holiness goes out the window with some people. Holiness is for the winter. And uh, married women must remember that they don't dress like teenagers. Amen. Married women ought to have respect for their bodies to know that some things teenagers dress with are not uh, proper for married women. Read the little book that I prepared on holiness and modesty. That will cover that in greater detail. Okay? And I think that we need to mention the children here. Write that down in your list there. Every one of you parents need to know where your children are at all times. I was at a church lately where there was a young boy that uh, come and asked permission of the pastor to sit with uh, certain people. And the pastor had a rule in that church, Brother Wayne McLean's church, that no young person could sit in the sanctuary under 13 years of age, even if their parents weren't in the church, without being seated with an adult. So that child always had supervision during the church service. I thought, fantastic. That is order. No wonder they have such a great, moving, powerful church, because they're not going to put up with foolishness and visiting and coming and going. Okay? Children need to know... uh, uh, where the parents are and be with them, and the parents need to know where the children are and be with them. Okay? Now, all that groundwork here, we're going to move in now to the, to the nitty-gritty here for a few minutes, and I want us to think about discipline. Let's say discipline. Discipline, when you begin to really study the word discipline out, it has its roots in true love. Let's say true love. The Bible teaches us that a child that's left to his own will will become a disgrace to his mother and to his father because most children will go the wrong way. And so discipline has its roots in in love. We love you, and that's why we discipline you. We care for you, and that's why we try to do something to help our church. Parents love their children, and that's why they discipline their children. And any parent that loves their child uh, they will never love them too much to, to let, leave off discipline because discipline is a part of love. And uh, if a child is to understand what true love is, I'm speaking about that that's associated with agape love, they will include in that agape love the kind of love that will also involve discipline. First John chapter 4 and verse number 16 makes a statement like this, And we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. When we see that God loves us, and how many of you believe that God does love us? How many are sure that He does? How many have ever been corrected because He loves you? Well, of course we have. I don't think there's a person in the world that loved me any more when I was growing up than my mama. But I want you to know, friend, she did some fairly fancy uh, correcting. And the word discipline is more than just correcting when you do wrong. It was that concern that stood on the porch with a with her house coat on at 10 o'clock, wondering where Charles was if he wasn't in at a certain hour. That was love, friend. I look back on it now and I think she must have really loved me. She didn't want me to be out getting into trouble. And so there were were rules. So it's because of the nature of God's agape love, that love that that requires something of us, that God disciplines those whom He loves. And discipline then flows out of his concern for our good. Write that down. Discipline grows out of God's concern for our good. Amen. And then in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 6, the Bible tells us, for those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. One translation says he chastens. And he scourges every son whom he receives. So to be a son of God and to be a child of God includes with it the responsibility on the part of He as our Heavenly Father, the right to to correct us if and when we do wrong. Amen. I look at Sister Cheryl now after all this time of wanting a child, our daughter Cheryl. 
and uh, to see. And we went to a restaurant lately to eat with them when we were with them. And little uh, Austin is growing up now and having to be challenged, you know, in his self-will, just like you and I. But here he kept doing what his, what his father said to stop doing. No, 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 no. And finally, Brother Ron, just like a loving father, took that hand and... And that little face just, just curled up there and he looked so pitiful. You know, and grandparents, the first thing, grandparents, well, was that necessary? Now, I didn't say that, see. I have uh, enough grandchildren to know that I had better keep my big mouth shut and I had better let the one who's responsible do the correcting, whether I think it was the right thing or not. I did. Always think that was good? No, you didn't like it, did you? Something else here. Sister Reed. A little louder, I can't hear you. Never, never, never talk back. Never talk back. <laughs> and let's all say that together. Never talk back. I think it was uh, Brother Muncie, uh, we mentioned him sometime when Philip down the basement, you know. Mad at his dad for the correction. He's down there just saying all kinds of things about his daddy and some mad, just venting his feelings. And his remarks were going up through the duct system, you know. And his dad was picking the signal up upstairs. Hey, Philip, what you saying down there? Come on up here. Okay, somebody else here. Brother Morano. All right. We had to be respectful of elders. Amen. They didn't have to pull their ID card out to find out how old they were either. If they were older than us, they were worthy of respect. Say praise the Lord. Sister Betty Jo. Table manners, especially when the minister came through. Oh, Betty Jo, that's a real good point there. In other words, really have good manners when he comes by. All right. Sister Carol. No telephone calls with boys after nine. Isn't that amazing that her mom and daddy had the same message from God that I did? Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody else had their hand up over here. Sister Marilyn. Not to go anywhere without specific permission for that specific place to go. Amen. Very good rules. Somebody over here. Sister Cindy. Call older people, not by their first name, but by Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so. Betty Jones. Oh, amen. Say amen again, everybody. Amen. That is a real major point in the breakdown of our, our American lifestyle today. Girls were not allowed to call boys. Now, we're talking about disciplines that the family lived by. All right, on this side. Somebody over here, Sister Brenda. Had to come straight home from school. And that was a discipline. It was a rule, but it was carried through. And it was for your good. All right? So you see, before anyone can really appreciate what discipline's all about, they have to have belief and trust in the one that's giving that discipline, and the person giving that discipline must also be living by the disciplines that they require of other people for it to be working properly, okay? And so in the Old Testament Scriptures, they had a very good understanding of what discipline was all about concerning right and wrong because the the definition under God's laws, it just simply was spelled out, if you do this, quacko. It's almost like a Islam today, you know. I mean, the law back then, if you did certain things, if you committed adultery, just get the rocks and you're going down the drain. You can say goodbye to Grandma and everybody. You're dead. <laughs> same, same rules were, uh, could be applied for fornication. And... Uh, uh, if a person did certain acts of indecency, they were dealt with, okay? And so if anybody broke the law uh, and it was documented, well, of course, they were disciplined. And then there were specific judgments that were mandated for particular sins. might be interesting for you to study that sometime. However, when we get to the New Testament Scriptures, now we're under grace and we have the Word of God. God has come through Christ to redeem us, to justify us, to pronounce us blameless. And we're living... Uh, under a different set of circumstances, still the moral laws are the same, 
But uh, we, uh, oftentimes, when we do wrong, well, then we don't have to wait for someone to document our wrongs. We can go to God and we can go to the throne of grace for our own self. And He is willing to hear our petition and will cover our sins with His blood. And we can be clean and pure. Isn't that beautiful? Aren't you happy today that we can go boldly to the throne of grace? Now, that doesn't mean we go out and blatantly do things that are terribly wrong and expect to just run back and forth and get another application of grace. But in speaking about this today, I want you to just get this in your mind that God is definitely concerned with His people. So, inasmuch as we're living in the dispensation of grace, and this particularly being the church age, then the church living in this environment must also have disciplines. The church must have discipline. Jesus is returning for a bride one of these days. And when Jesus returns for his bride, the Bible teaches us that he's coming back after a bride that what? Has made herself ready. And that bride is to be without what? Spot. Let's say spot. Without blemish. And also the Bible says without wrinkles. And if I'm not mistaken, Sister Rosie gave a beautiful uh, testimony one time about wrinkles. One time a couple of years ago, I remember her testimony talking about wrinkles. Sometimes we, we, we neglect that God wants us to have even the little wrinkles ironed out. Now, all the things that I mentioned a, a little while ago to lay the foundation for this, you might not say all of those things are just blatant, dark, terrible sins, but they are blemishes or spots or they're wrinkles on what could be different if we just put a little work to our, to our program. Say praise the Lord. And so the first objective then of discipline... I want you to think about this tonight, is to purify the assembly, the body of Christ, in other words. We're talking about discipline now more specifically. So the first objective of discipline, then, is to purify our assembly of those things that would be, would be uh, uh, against what God would have for us. So what we need to do is to be purified, need to be uh, changed, need to be cleaned. The whole purpose, then, of discipline is uh, very much involved in this matter of restoration. Restoring something that could be better. Uh, putting it back to its best, uh, best uh, position. Turning it around. Doing things a little bit differently here. So, leadership, then, and that falls in the category of what I am as your pastor here today, then I obvious, obviously, then, from the standpoint of the call of God, I have the responsibility to take care of and to protect this assembly from those things that I think that would be, uh, you know, against the, the growth of this assembly. How many can see that? Are you happy that I even care? I think that uh, I think that we need to care more than we do. All of us. Too many things are just loose. We uh, have much more mercy and patience in some things, and I think God even requires of us. I think that sometimes when you come down a little harder and drop the hammer a little quicker. Some people respect a whole lot more than just letting things slide and hope people will work it out later on. Oh, yeah, some people will leave the church once in a while, but uh, uh, they are going to be restricting the growth of the church if they can't take discipline. Say praise the Lord. Okay, so then our sec second objective then in discipline, in church discipline I'm speaking of particularly here then, is to reconcile the sinner. In other words, if our first objective then is to discipline and purify our own self, then it is the secondary purpose then of church discipline is to reconcile a sinner. When a sinner comes into this assembly and begins to attend here and we make them feel comfortable, we try to preach messages that would make them want to serve Christ, we teach Bible studies that would let them know that this is the right church, and uh, then they... Uh, they are to be reconciled. The only way they can be reconciled is through Christ. But we as His body have the responsibility of the ministry of reconciliation. We don't change our ways to be like they are to make them comfortable, but rather we should create an environment where they would like to be more like Christ and give up sin. So our purpose then in our objective of church discipline is to reconcile that sinner to Christ Jesus. We don't want them as a sinner to fall short of the grace of God, and we don't want them to feel that they can continue in sin, that grace would abound, but that they would be willing to yield their will to the will of God so that their purpose in life could be fulfilled. And we seek for them to experience a change. Say hallelujah. 
Uh, sometimes people want to teach Search for Truth Bible studies, and Brother uh, Hicks always is to come to me and ask me if I think it's all right for a certain person to teach home Bible study. And some people might think, well, I don't agree with that at all. Anybody ought to teach home Bible study. Some people are like the fisherman that goes out and gets caught by the fish. In other words, if a person isn't established enough in what they believe, they go out there and try to win a soul, and the soul wins them. They aren't, aren't strong enough to even substantiate what they believe, and so they go out there not able to confront the arguments and the questions, and, they, and then their so-called love for, for people is overwhelming the love they have for the truth, and they are won by the fish instead of the fish won to the Lord. The Bible says He'd make of us fishers of men. So that's the reason that the Bible says that we shouldn't lay hands on anybody too quickly. And I don't think that altogether means the ministry, but there are times when people go out, they're not prepared to do what they uh, want to do because they haven't been faithful, because they're not loyal, because they're not obedient, because they're not mannerly, because they're not willing to take correction. So they want to go out and tell everybody else how to live, and as a result, they fail because they've just got their boat too loaded. So more often than not... I tell Brother Hicks, if somebody I don't think is ready, I'll say, no, I just think they'd be better off to just go ahead and love God and worship God and all because it's not going to work out good. The times that we have made exceptions to that because of extreme mercy to the person, thinking they had been restored sufficiently to have their head on straight, we were wrong. But the Keith Lehman can say amen and he knows what I'm talking about here. Some are not even in this church tonight that didn't have enough stamina and stability and holiness and dedication to live right in the presence of the one that's trying to win. Some of you that are in the church here know what I'm talking about tonight because the person that taught you the home Bible study was not the example that they should have been later on. And you had to rebuke the one that taught you the home Bible study for not living in your presence the way that they should have lived. Say praise the Lord. How many can see why church has to have dis discipline? Amen. If we're going to make it, we're going to have to have more discipline than we have even now. Say praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So God severely judges those sins that cause others to stumble. God judges certain sins differently than He judges other sins. Sins that cause other people to stumble, God judges those kind of sins you look in the Proverbs and you look all through the Scriptures and you will see something. God, He is very harsh with people that cause other people to stumble. And so sins of rebellion, let's say rebellion. Sins of malicious gossip. People that can't keep their trap shut and go around loose-tonguing and, and talking and gossiping. God puts His hand on them and He, re, he rebukes them strongly. He paints them such a bright color that everybody knows what their difficulty is. Because God loves you and I so much that He does not want anything to hinder us from making it. The Scripture says, He would not that any should perish. And so when someone is rebellious and someone is uh, not yielding to God's will, it's amazing how harshly God rebukes those that sin and their sins affect other people and cause them to stumble. Now, our response when God comes to rebuke us or to reprove us or to correct us is that we would respond so quickly that the result of our rebuke and the result of our rebellion and the result of our actions wouldn't have to spread like a disease. Say amen. One of the big uh, reluctance uh, that you find, biggest reluctance is in operating on a person with cancer is the danger that in that operation that that disease would not uh, be taken care of, but rather would spread. I think sometimes that that's the way we look at sin. We look at sin and think we know good and well that people are not doing right, and we just allow them to go ahead hoping to God that it doesn't get any worse and won't affect more people. When God would have us to get the Holy Bible out, get on our knees with prayer and get some Holy Ghost scissors and go to whacking away right quick before it infects everything. Say, praise the Lord. Say, amen. Now, we act then in discipline in a manner that God says must be done with love. We act because we love the church. We don't hate the individual that's the object of the correction, but we love the church so much that we're not going to allow 
that infection to, to hinder the total growth of the church in the local church is important. This is what God's using as his lighthouse to disciple the world himself. So church discipline. Let's say church discipline. I hope you're writing some of these things down. Maybe I'll provide it for you in a written manner a little bit later on. Church discipline may be painful, and it may also be very unpleasant because none of us like to be corrected. None of us like to have uh, ourselves uh, uh, openly uh, revealed. But church discipline, while it might be painful, it might be very unpleasant, does contain the hope of restoration. The Bible teaches us that if a person is not rebuked and is not reproved, then that that they're doing that's wrong will ultimately one day destroy them. So it doesn't look quite so bad after all if they're given opportunity to make restitution. Restoration then can come about. So mercy in the New Testament church triumphs, it seems here, over judgment. And there seems to be, always seems to be hope for the offender. That's one of the beautiful things about the New Testament. In the Old Testament, when there was an offender... Too often the case, it seems like, that I mean, there was just no opportunity to ever make it right. I mean, they were, they were done away with. They were rebuked so harshly that it was a final thing within the New Testament church. It seems like that God has, has, he has become weaker, but yet he became a man so they could know how we felt. And as a result, the Bible says he's easily touched by the feelings of our infirmities, and he is also deeply moved by the things that affect us. And because of his love, he has given us pastors and leaders and shepherds and the Spirit and the Word, all these things working to our benefit so that we can be restored and uh, we can be free from the, the guilt and the pain of our rebellion. Okay, so let me say that church discipline then should always be undertaken with a spirit of, uh, of compassion, heart compassion. It really cares, okay? Now, we'll hold you just about five more minutes, and then we're going to have to spend at least another night or two in this particular series of lessons. Now, the Lord has promised that in the midst of all of His servants here, at the times of these corrections or these uh, rebukes or the times of re re reproof, uh, that uh, His servants at all times are to be to be kind and to be to be uh, gentle, and not to stir up a spirit of strife. And so the subject of church discipline, I think, is dealt with very carefully in Matthew chapter 18, in the 12th through the 20th verses, and that's a, a part of our doctrine of our church. It tells us how to deal with differences between one brother and another brother. And uh, that's outside your local family. If you have problems in your local family, you deal with that in a family sense. You don't bring that all before the church husband and wife fall out with each other, that isn't to be dealt with openly before the church. Say praise the Lord. That's to be dealt with in a manner just differently than what would be dealt with if people in the church are warring in their uh, ways with each other. So all these particular verses make specific emphasis on the leader's attitude in these things, always being willing to extend forgiveness. How many like to be forgiven when you're done wrong? God forgives us, and I want you to know tonight, my friend, there is not a one of us in this church here, I don't believe one person in this whole church tonight, but what would be willing to forgive anybody, almost anything in the world, because we all want to see each other saved. Say hallelujah. If anything, when people do wrong, it, it gives them opportunity to grow if they're willing to clean themselves of, of attitudes and things that are wrong. and Go ahead and go with God. Some that have had the most rebukes have been restored two or three or four times and been able to sing behind the pulpit and been able to do things to be a blessing and been encouraged and uh, lauded and complimented. And in the next phase, it's another roller coaster trip and back out again in pressure and strong things going opposite to the will of God. But the Lord still wants people to, to be forgiven. Say hallelujah. All right. So in the book of Matthew, chapter number 18, I think you'd be wise to read that. And uh, particularly, you can see the need for discipline there as being a good thing in that chapter, the 12th through the 20th verses, but particularly the 13th and the 14th, 15th, 16th, and the 17th verses. All right. Now, one little area here before we call it quits for tonight. 
Who should exercise discipline? Who should exercise discipline? Now, in most cases, I think that if it's family, that the family should be the one that takes care of exercising the discipline. There are times when families will come to me as a pastor and uh, invite my help in dealing with a particular family problem in the area of discipline of a child or discipline of a teenager or reproving someone. But when we get into the areas of a brother or sister in the Lord that's on a different level and it's not in the confines of your family, then I think it's very careful, uh, carefully dealt with in Scripture and it has to be dealt with with those who have authority. When people begin to rebuke each other, it can get to be a regular dogfight because it then becomes a, on the level of comparing your wrongs with that person's wrong. And when you are disciplining from the standpoint of the Scripture, it's not a matter of how right somebody is and how wrong somebody is. It's a matter of getting into the proper position where the church can, can cease to suffer from this, this problem. So any adult in the body of Christ is responsible for the whole congregation not to just get up and openly rebuke, but if you're sitting on the bench with somebody that's talking out and being disrespectful to the house of God, you shouldn't have to go and call for an usher to quieten them down. You have the authority as an adult that cares about this body to, to request of someone that's sitting on that same bench, would you mind uh, ceasing to disturb this service? I, uh, I'd like to hear. Say praise the Lord. Now, that should be done in a kind way, but you have the right to admonish somebody on that particular level. If somebody's sitting there talking about what's being said, making fun of it, don't think that we don't notice that up here sometimes. We notice it. And uh, making light of what's being said in the Bible study, you can kindly just ask them, listen, I really appreciate what I'm hearing. You know, I really don't think it's right for us to, to criticize. And uh, let's, let's be respectful in the house of God. You have the right to do that. Say praise the Lord. Say hallelujah. If children are running in all directions and you say, well, it's not my kid, you have the right to reach out in a gentle manner and take the child by the hand and say, hey, I don't think your mom and daddy would like you to be running in the house of God. That's my kids or yours. Now, don't yank one's arm halfway off and then look at another one and, and make a difference because you'll have to yank a lot of arms to even it up because parents are very, very careful to notice those uh, uh, you know, those uh, differences that are made. But we all are stewards of this place of worship. So hallelujah. God's going to give us more kids. I pray to God He will. That looks like the only hope the Sunday school has to grow. We are at zero growth. When a Sunday school class and the Bible class, and I don't say because it's mine, when it's, when it's the only one that's having any visitors, something is wrong when we don't have regular visitors in all the classes, mine and any other class. So let's get on the ball. Maybe it's because people don't feel safe when they come through those doors. Maybe they've been knocked around the water fountain a couple of times. Maybe they see the disarray. Maybe they see the lack of manners, and they're not impressed by this place. Come on now, let's say Amen. I'm willing to admit the wrongs, and you ought to be willing too, because some of these things, we're going to have to confront them if we want this church to grow. Let's say manners. Let's say respect. Let's say order. Say hallelujah. Now, if you and a brother in the Lord or sister in the Lord have some difficulty between you, the Bible teaches us in the 18th chapter there of the book of Matthew, in the 15th verse, that... If your brother or your sister, of course, sins against you, then you can go and the Bible says you can reprove them in private. If they've done you wrong, you can say, look, you did me wrong. Now, don't go to half a dozen people and say, I'm going to go tell them. You go to them and tell them they did you wrong. The Bible gives you a right to do that. But it's not to be brought out in that particular manner at that particular stage. Now, if it goes into full-blown fuss then the ministry will have to get involved. But you see, a person that wants the right thing for the purpose and the will of God to be accomplished should be able, in a spirit of love, to go to someone that has done them wrong and let them know they did them wrong. Say hallelujah. Say, look, now, I'm going to love you and the Lord, and I want, I want your respect, but you did me wrong. You took unfair advantage of me, or you talked about me. I want you to know that that hurt me. 
And by your bringing it to their attention, you are reproving them. But you better be very sure that you are clean yourself in every way because that person, if they're not full of the Holy Ghost, will come right back and say, yeah, but so-and-so. All right, let's say amen. Now, notice the use of the word brother here instead of the, the word sheep. Now, because you see, uh, someone uh, is allotted to your charge when you begin to think of this in the terms of sheep. Sheep have someone in charge of them. But in this particular sense, it's dealing with person to person. And if there's something wrong between brother and sister, then brother and sister can go and get it worked out. But the entire flock of God, if it's to infect the entire flock, then the shepherd has to move in and take care of the situation. Now, I believe that this is an important step that we need to recognize here so that if we are to confront a brother or sister that's errant. Let's say, for instance, somebody gets mad about what the Bible study is about. And they come and bend your ear and begin to tell you, well, I don't believe all that stuff. You should be caring enough to say, look, my brother or my sister, our pastor is just concerned about our church. He has no ill toward you, but you must recognize that you're in the wrong. Say praise the Lord. You can be kind and patient, but you don't want to let people bend your ear and make them think that you agree with them because you're becoming a participant in their sins. And all the people said amen. Now, all these steps that are detailed here in this particular passage of Scripture, then it makes it easy for a spiritual condition to be, to be restored to a local church. And the positive force for good can be put back in motion again. Because if little problems are not solved on the level that they happen, then they begin to infect and affect other people, and then it becomes a bigger problem, and you never seem to get it all worked out when people begin to get a big problem and get a full-blown deal going. For instance, someone not long ago wanted to sing specials in church. I'm not going to call their name. But they can't sing. I said no. They got mad at me and left the church because they couldn't sing specials in church. I said, we have a choir and uh, not everybody has a solo type voice. Aren't you glad that I got enough sense to not put somebody in the pulpit there to sing that can't carry a tune? You'd be ashamed if uh, somebody came to visit and I had somebody here singing special. All right, that person tells it that I wouldn't let them sing in the choir, which wasn't true. And there's people not on these pews tonight because they sympathize with them. And then those people have, doesn't matter how wrong they are, have a way of affecting people that are not even involved. And so they go and visit their homes and bend their ears. And before long, they get the idea that the church is mean to people. When we're not mean to people at all. Somebody's got to, got to say, I'll take the initiative. Not everybody is going to sing specials. Say, praise the Lord. And if a person can't take the, the, the instruction and say, no, not everybody can sing specials. And uh, you'll do good to go ahead and sing in the choir. That should be good enough. But no, it don't work that way. And I get painted as a bad guy. I don't think that's fair, but that, that's... I'm used to that, so I'll weather that. But you see, that's the kind of things that hinder growth. And when people won't take the instruction of a pastor and won't listen to the, those in leadership and then confront you and then go tell everybody a story that's different than what it really was, and then instead of the people coming and asking you what happened, they go and draw their opinions and then it, they drag their little children out of the church. And then before long, the work of God is hindered and the devil is just having a laughing good time because people won't listen to the instruction of a pastor. And when the person that is being instructed has been in and out of the church a half a dozen times or so, and you keep restoring them, hoping that you can get them to the place they can be productive, and then down again, then at some point in time, we've got to spend our energies on people that, whose heart is good soil instead of always worrying about those that won't take instruction. We could spend all of our time on those that won't take instruction, and we'd all be going around and around in circles all the time. And that's exactly what the devil would like us to do. We better start spending our energies on people that has a ability to receive and those who are interested in taking instruction. We'll never call them. The, the dirtiest character in Detroit's welcome here. And Colvin Young's welcome here if he comes here. But anybody that comes here is going to have to line up to the Word of God if they're going to be a member. Say praise the Lord. Now, how many of you understand what I'm talking about now? This is the saints' meeting tonight, and I'm being very plain with you. When I call and ask somebody, well, why, why aren't you at church? 
And uh, they said, well, I'm, I'm praying, reading my Bible, I seem to do better here uh, at home. Why? Well, because of the way you did so-and-so. And then they'd tell me what I did to so-and-so, and I said, no, I didn't do that to so-and-so. Not at all. That wasn't it. But by the time that they get the right story, they've already been bent and twisted to where they don't have enough dignity and uh, humility to come and get on back in here and get in gear because their ears have already been bent, their spirit's been twisted, and they feel uncomfortable. Because, you see, one little trip away from the will of God, just like if that finger stayed home one day, you couldn't put it back on there. If it got cut off in a lawnmower, they'd have to get it on there quick or it'd die. Say Amen. They'd have to do something to put it on ice and get me somewhere quick and then hope to God it would work out. And when people think they can stay home, get their own mail, read their own Bible, rebuke the ministry, criticize the pastor, criticize everybody else and think they're still a part of the body of Christ, I want to tell you what tonight, they're not a part of the body of Christ any more than the man in the moon. Say hallelujah. Hey, this is not a game. This is a church. This is the body of Christ. Say praise the Lord. Rub your hand and say, Lord, help me to stay in the body. I'm not suggesting to you that this local church is only the church in town that's right, but I'm telling you, it don't matter who you are. If you don't want God's Word and the correction that is right, it doesn't matter what your particular place of worship is, you have to yield to God's Word. Say, praise God. There will be a lot of children that will go to hell because mama and dad or mama, or dad, or whoever the case may be, was not humble enough to admit they were wrong. I hope this isn't too plain. But I, I've got to tell you some things. My, my heart is in this church. My spirit's wrapped up in your future. My, my Bible, and the will of God, the Spirit of the living God. We have to have disciplines in a church. It would be a free-for-all if we didn't have discipline. Somebody says, well, you said fornicators can't sing in the choir. And so since you didn't let so-and-so sing in the choir, you were telling us that that person is a fornicator. I said, no, you've got the two stories put together. You ought to listen more closely. I didn't say so-and-so is a fornicator. I just said the fornicators wouldn't be allowed to sing in the choir. And everybody said amen. Because there's people in this town that sing in the choir on Sunday and live like the devil all week long. I can name some churches that have no disciplines at all. People live like they want to all week long and then come because they got a pretty voice and sing in the choir. I'm not talking about United Pentecostal churches, but churches that claim to have the truth. If I know somebody's out sleeping with a guy during the week or out sleeping with a woman in the week and they want to sing, I don't care if they're a canary. They're not getting in that choir and singing if I know they're not living right. Say praise the Lord. I don't want anybody singing to me that doesn't try to live right. Say hallelujah. So that's the disciplines of the church. Choir members must be making an attempt to live right. Say hallelujah. Let's clap our hands for the Lord. All right. I think we'll just stop it right there now. So the next part of our little study will go into the matter of discipline follows training. There will always be discipline when we're being trained.
Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings into the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow, become a servant of righteousness, keep self pure, be an example, have faith in God, follow Jesus, put first things first, resist temptation, be faithful, and be fruitful. What we do in life echoes in eternity. What we do in life echoes, 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 echoes in eternity.